Good morning. Today will be our part two of our message, Channels of His Power. We learned last week that God doesn't want us to be a reservoir or a container when he fills us with his Holy Spirit. He wants us to become a flowing river of living water to change the lives of those that he brings across our pathway. He blesses us that we might be a blessing. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I thank you, Lord, because you are here today and that I know that you're going to use these words today to speak to our hearts, Lord, and to awaken a hunger and a passion within us, Lord, to be everything that you called us to be, that your name might be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Today's verse is, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Now that I and me in that verse is a prophecy that refers to Jesus. And actually, you know, he talked about it over in the book of Hebrews, and we know it's referring to Jesus, even though it was written hundreds of years before Jesus ever came. But when it says, I am the children whom thou hast given me, the children are those who believe in Jesus, the family of God. And we have been given, it says, for signs or evidence or proof, a miraculous sign of the power of God, a wonder, a special display of, the, of God's power, a miracle, a sign, a wonder. Friends, this is why he has baptized us in the Holy Ghost, all right? It says in Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This is that dunamis power, miraculous miracle working power will come on us after the Holy Ghost comes upon us, and you shall be witnesses unto me. The reason he gives us the Holy Spirit, friends, is that our lives might be an evidence and a proof that Christ is alive and that there is a God who loves us and cares for us. I remember hearing my brother tell about this one time. This was many, many years ago, and God used him in the gifts of the Spirit especially in the gifts of healing. And um, he went to visit this lady because he was pastoring a small church. And this was an elderly lady. But her husband claimed to be an atheist. He was a very cantankerous old man. And he was quite a sickly old man. So after my brother Harold had prayed with the wife and talked with her and encouraged her in the Lord, he turned to the man and he said, you know, God wants to heal you. And the man said, well, I don't believe there's a God. I don't believe there's any God. So there's no point in you praying. I don't want you to pray. And my brother somehow, you know, it must have been one of the gifts of the spirit, like a gift of faith that makes you so bold because he just reared up and said, I don't really care if you believe or not. God has told me he wants to heal you and I'm gonna pray for you and God is going to heal you. And he prayed over the man and spoke words of healing into him and the man was instantaneously healed. And he began to weep and he began to cry and he gave his heart to the Lord and recognized there was a true and a living God. Today, we're going to talk about the nine gifts of the Spirit that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 to 10. I'm not going to read all those verses. We read them last week, they, and they name these nine gifts of the Spirit because there are other gifts in other parts of the Bible, but today we're talking about these nine gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And these nine gifts can be divided into three groups, all right? The revelation gifts, the inspirational or vocal gifts, and the third 
and not least the power gifts, all right? I'm going to repeat it again. The revelation gifts, the inspirational or vocal gifts, the power gifts. There's three in each of these groupings. Now, what do they represent? We're going to go over to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, and um, we'll read through 10. But actually, I'm just going to comment on 8 and 10. But 9 connects the two, so we're going to read them all. He was taken. This is a prophecy. We know that Isaiah 53 is that great prophecy of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And they were fulfilled to the very T. Everything in that Isaiah 53 was totally fulfilled, even though it was written maybe 700 years before Jesus ever came to this earth. It says, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So what does that mean? It means that he was cut off, he was killed, all right? He had no offspring. Who will declare his generation? He had no descendants. He had never gotten married before he died. And this verse tells us the reason he died, all right, and was killed was for the transgression of the people of God. Verse nine, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. It means he himself had never sinned. When he died, he took your sin and my sin upon him and suffered the curse of our sins. Yet, verse 10 says, yet, even though he had done none himself, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. God allowed this to happen to Jesus. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. All right. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. So what does that mean? It means when you and I make his soul an offering for sin. When we say, Lord, I cannot pay for my own sin, but I offer you Jesus who died in my place. He took my place. He bore my sin. Lord, I offer up his soul to you. It says the moment we do that, all right, uh, we become a child of God. Uh, that's when it says he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. Uh, in other words, he begins to live again. Now in you and through you, or in me and through me, in us and through us, all right? His life was cut off then, but every time a person turns and says, oh God, because of what Jesus did, save me. Oh, I accept his work for my sins. Forgive me for his sake, immediately, he begins to live. He comes into your heart. He comes into my heart. He begins to live and he begins to prolong his days. As long as we serve the Lord, the Lord is living in and through us. And you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus has never changed what he did, what he said, what he thought on earth when he lived here, he's still doing the same, but in you and me. So let's look here. What do these three groupings represent, all right? According to that Isaiah 53, the revelation gifts are the mind of Christ, all right? The thoughts of Christ, what he knows, what he thinks, and what he purposes, all right? The, these three are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. And just like he had that when he was here on earth, he still has it today. Only he imparts it in and through you and me. So the revelation gifts are things that you and I cannot know in ourselves, but the Lord reveals them to us because 
Jesus is in us and he's the same as he's always been. The inspirational or the vocal gifts represent the words of Christ, what he says, how he would speak into the life of a person, all right? And then the power gifts are the ability of Christ, the deeds of Christ, the works of Christ, his miracles, his uh, healing power. It's still flowing today, but it's going to flow in and through us. I, I would like to say right now that these gifts many times overlap. Sometimes in one um, action or deed, there might be two or three of the gifts together, but we're going to study them one by one. And today, we're going to just take up the revelation gifts. We don't have time to do more than that, so we'll just do the definition and function of the revelation gifts. That's the first grouping, which represents the mind of Christ, the thoughts of Christ, what he knows and what he thinks and what he purposes. Let, let's look at the word of wisdom. Remember, I told you there's three. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits, all right? Now, this, I want you to realize when I say this, the word of wisdom, this is not the gift of wisdom, all right? Not the gift of wisdom. I, I remember many, many years ago when there was a lady um, and spiritual pride came into her and she just informed her husband one day, I, God has given me the gift of wisdom and I don't need you telling me what to do. I have the wisdom of God and I can, you know, I know what to do. There is no gift like that. That was sheer pride. That was her flesh that didn't want to submit to her husband, all right? So it is not the gift of wisdom. It is the word of wisdom. When I say to you, may I have a word with you, you don't expect me to talk all day long. A word is just a short moment, just a little bit, just all right. So when he gives us a word of wisdom, he just drops into us. This is what a word of wisdom is, a word a fragment, a portion of God's wisdom. Now, what is God's wisdom? In the book of James, we find out there, are, I think it's chapter three, there are two wisdoms. The wisdom that is from above, that's God's wisdom. And the wisdom that is from beneath, that's the world's wisdom. It's the devil's way of doing things. But this is God's way of doing things. And it is supernaturally revealed to us by God. And it always glorifies God. It always glorifies God. Now, I want us to see this verse, Colossians 2, 3. I felt God gave me this verse uh, when I was preparing for this message. I had never really seen it in conjunction with this before. But I'm going to read it to you. It says, in whom... In whom means in Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Friends, I want you to know only Jesus himself has all knowledge and all wisdom, all right? And he will drop a word of wisdom into us or a word of knowledge as we need it to help us in whatever situation that we're in or to help somebody else in their situation. And what we have and what we receive, we must draw from him. He alone, let me read it again, in whom, that means in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All right. So that, that just thrills my heart. So that a word of wisdom, it's supernaturally revealed by God. Now, what, there's um, three things that it is, all right? I've told you the first, a word, a fragment, a portion of God's wisdom or God's way of doing things. Number two, it's a supernatural solution to a problem. A supernatural solution to a problem. I, I'm going to give you an illustration to go with this. 
um, there was a um, girl. This took place many hundreds of years ago. Now, I'm exaggerating. Maybe 100 over, close to 200, over in Europe, all right? And the church was going through a lot of persecution. And they had been told that they could not gather together and meet a as a church. This young lady, it was nighttime, and she was on her way to church. And she was stopped by a group of soldiers. And they said, where are you going? She didn't want to tell a lie. She stood there for a moment and her heart cried out to the Lord, Lord, help me, what do I say? And immediately out of her mouth came these words, I'm going to my, the home of my elder brother. The family is going to be meeting there. They're going to be reading his last will and testament. And they said, fine, you may go. She didn't tell a lie. No human being would have thought of an answer like that. That was God's answer uh, to give to them. All right. Uh, my elder brother's home was the church. Uh, the whole family, the family are going to meet together. His last will and testament is the Bible is going to be read, and I'm going to be there. And they gave her permission to go, and yet she never told a lie. This was a word of wisdom that was dropped into her heart. Uh, we're talking about a supernatural solution to a problem. Um, my father, many years ago, many years ago, all right, because he, he wasn't even married then, and um, he went to China in 1920, so it was before that. He lived in Hawaii, and there he, it was, his wife had led him to the Lord, all right? And he was just a new believer, but he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he worked for this uh, company that, uh, because it was Hawaii, they had a lot of pineapple plantations. Uh, my father was a mechanical engineer. And so this plantation had um, called to his place where he worked and complained, they said that the big scale that we weigh our pineapples on just isn't working. It doesn't weigh correctly. And so they called my father. His last name was Hanson. They said, Hanson, go to such and such a place and fix the scale. Well, he went there. He did everything that he knew how to do. And uh, actually, he was sent there two times. And they complained because what he did didn't seem to help. And so the boss was really angry and called him in and said, Hanson, uh, you know, I'm just going to fire you. And, and my father said, you know what? I have done everything that I know how to do. Now, I have just started believing in Jesus. I'm a new Christian. You give me 24 hours off, and I'm going to pray to my God. If he gives me an answer, I'll go over and I'll do it. If he doesn't give me an answer, well, you won't see my face. You don't need to fire me. I just won't come back anymore. So my father fasted and prayed. And you know what? In the night, God gave him a dream. And in that dream, God spoke to him, showed him the scales, showed him the big weights that go to the scale, and told him, said, these weights belong to a different scale. They don't belong to this scale. And that's why it's not weighing correctly. And then in that dream, God showed him precision. How much each of those weights, how much to take off so they would fit that scale and, and it would come the right weight. And in the morning he awakened, he wrote down everything he had seen in that dream and he rushed over to that plantation and he did what God had told him, and the scale worked. Amen. So I'm here to tell you, that was a word of wisdom that God dropped into his heart. And it was through a dream. He saw it in a dream, heard it all in a dream. And when he put it to the test, it worked. Our God is a living God. He is alive, and he is real. Now, I told you, 
it is also a word of direction. All right. A word of wisdom is always who, where, when, how. It's like a verb. It answers all these questions. All right. And it's a word of direction. And I remember uh, my daughter Pam telling me this. This was way in the early years. Now, she's been over there 40 years plus. She's in her 60s now. And uh, she was in her early 20s when she went over there. And one day she, you know, she had run out of money. She didn't have uh, food. She wasn't sent by anybody. She had just gone. And the Lord spoke to her and said, go to the airport. And, and she didn't know, why should I go to the airport? But it came to her very strongly, go to the airport. So she went off to the airport. And she, like she said, uh, the airport in those days wasn't like it is now. You could get right up to the airport, you know, and look in through the door. Now you're way uh, far away from the inside of the airport. But she went down to the airport. And she rushed up there and she looked. She didn't know who she was looking for. And when she looked in there, she saw me in the line coming. Now, God had told me to go to Nepal. He had told me to bring money and things over for Pam. But she hadn't gotten my letter or my email. In those days, it was very, very difficult uh, trying to, you know, get together or to let each other know things. And I had obeyed God, even though I remember when I was in Thailand trying to get a plane out of there, I, I was told right to the face uh, that you will never make it. There's no way you can. But I just kept quiet because God told me to go, and I knew I was to go. And I just sat in that taxi and just said, God, you make a way where there is no way. And the plane was delayed so that when I got there, it had not taken off like I was told it would. And I was able to get on that flight, but she didn't know I was coming. And I didn't know where her house was, how I was to find her. I had no idea. I was just stepping out in faith, obeying what God had told me to do. And when she saw me, she was just overwhelmed with joy. And of course, we were uh, thankful. So. God had given her a word of direction or a word of wisdom and had also given me one on both sides, me in Singapore and her in the land that she works in. All right. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptural examples of this. All right. This, the first one is Acts 9, 11 and 12. Now, actually, this one has not only a word of wisdom, it has a word of knowledge, all right? So j just watch here. And the Lord said unto him, Arise. This is Ananias. When um, God calls Ananias to go to Saul, who had been blinded by the light on the road to Damascus. Arise. Notice this is a word of wisdom. Uh, Arise, go into the street, call straight, Inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. That's actually a word of knowledge, that last bit. The rest is all a word of wisdom. And, he, and then this one is a word of knowledge, verse 12. He hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So this is a word of knowledge. Now, let's go down and look at the word of knowledge, shall we? Uh, this is Colossians, I'm going to read to you, 2, 9, and 10. For in him, that means in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All right. Uh, not only is all wisdom and knowledge in Jesus, the fullness of the Godhead, that means Father, Son, and Spirit, all three, the fullness, whatever they can do, whatever they say, whatever they think, all of that is in Christ, all right? And it says what in verse 10? And you are complete in him. You don't have to go anywhere else. If you don't know what to do, go to him. And he can tell you what to do. Uh, I, yeah, I had another story, but I'm going to 
I, I, my time is fast going, so I think I better move on. It says, which is the head? That means he's the director. Jesus is the director, the overseer of all principality and power. That's spiritual forces, whether good or bad. <clears throat> Christ is the head. You and I are complete in Christ. Whatever we have need of, we go to him, ask him. He'll drop that word into our heart, all right? Um, let, let's go over there and see now. What is a word of knowledge? There are two things I want us to see about this. A word of knowledge is a word... Again, it's not all of his knowledge. It's just a word, a fragment of the knowledge of God concerning people, places, things, or circumstances. So, you know, it's more like a noun. It's just telling you something. It's not giving you direction. It's not asking you to do anything. It's just telling you something you never knew before. And uh, he supernaturally tells you, all right? And that's what number two says, divinely and supernaturally revealed, not obtained through the five senses. All right, I still remember when I was young and God had opened the way for me to, I'd left Bible school, so now I came back again. I really felt God had called me to the mission field and I went back to pick up my studies in Bible school. I was walking through the courtyard of um, the girls' dorm, and there was a young man and a young lady standing there uh, talking together. And as I walked by them to go upstairs to my room, I had a, an unkind thought just pass through my mind. It was my own fleshly thought, and I, I just thought, what does she see in him? Yeah, you know, I never said it out loud. They didn't know what I was thinking, but the moment I got by them, this dropped into me. That is your future husband. Oh my goodness. I, you might say I was happy. No, I was very angry. I didn't even stop to think. In fact, some of these gifts that had operated in me even before I knew what they were, only afterwards when I studied and learned the definition, I look back, oh, that was this gift. Oh, that was that gift. So many of you that are full of the Spirit, you've had the gifts of the Spirit operate in you. You just don't recognize it yet, all right? And I just remember when that, that was told to me, I became very angry. I, I was a very self-willed person at the time, and I stomped up my, the stairs to my room. When I went in my bedroom, I slammed the door, and I said, I will never marry him if he's the last person on the face of this earth. But you know what? <laughs> I married that man, and I stayed married to him for 68 years, and he just went to glory last year. God knows everything. He dropped that word of knowledge in to my heart, all right? I, I remember, and, and it has a similar thought there, but um, this was when our church was very, very small, and there was a man and a lady. Um, he was a very wonderful Bible teacher, and this lady had a daughter from a previous marriage who was a teenager then, and had already been in um, a Catholic school and had been put into a, a correctional because she was a little bit wild, all right? And uh, this young lady happened to come to church that day. She was a beautiful young lady, but suddenly I just knew, I knew, oh my, my husband's nephew, whose name was Cliff, he was with us for a few months and um, took over one of the churches for us, pastored it, and this is the word that came to me. That is Cliff's future wife. I almost fainted because she, yeah. So I went to my mother and I said, Mama, I have something to tell you. She said, you don't need to tell me. God has already told me. Um, 
that that's the one Cliff is going to marry. I said, oh, no. I went to my husband. He also knew it. Then we went to the stepfather, who was a man of God. And when we approached him, he said, yes, that thought came to me, but I threw it out. I know my daughter. No way can she ever marry a man of God. And I just said that was the devil, and I wouldn't receive that at all. But you know what? When the Lord gives us a word of knowledge, he doesn't give us all the details. He just gave that detail, all right? That is Cliff's future wife. What he didn't say is, I'm going to save her. I'm going to baptize her in the Holy Spirit, which he did. And sure enough, they got married, and they're married to this day, which has been, uh, you know, 50 years down the line, uh, maybe even 60 years they're still married, happily married today, and they pastored churches. Amen. But that was a word of knowledge. There was no way I could know it any other way. It was divinely revealed. My daughter tells of how um, she went to this church. I, I've forgotten right now where it was, but she looked in the window and she saw a man with a red shirt on. Besides other people, she saw this red shirt. And God just said to her, the man in red is lying. And she thought, what? What? What is that all about? But when she went in, the missionaries that were there called her into the office and said, we want to ask you, there's somebody here and we need to know something. And she said, you mean the man in the red shirt? And they said, how did you know? She said, I will tell you right now, he's lying. Before you even ask me anything, the man in the red shirt is lying. What he's telling you is not the truth. So my friend, God is able just to drop a word of knowledge into our hearts, all right? We're gonna go now, as I can see, my goodness, my time is fast running away. We're gonna go to the third thing under the revelation gifts, and that is discerning of spirits. This is the supernatural ability to perceive the source of a spiritual manifestation. All right. In other words, is that manifestation from God? Is it from the devil? Is it from the flesh? Are we to accept it? Are we to reject it? Are we to rely upon it or are we to resist that manifestation? All right. Again, this was a story my daughter told me. All right. Uh, in fact, last week, if I'm not mistaken, I told you as when I was a teenager sitting on the end of a pew, how that man came in. And when he began to speak and give a message in tongues, he, you know, he held his shirt, uh, his suit jacket and, began to give it out, and, and the hair just stood up on my arms, and I just, get me away from him. I'm afraid of him. I don't want anything to do with him. I didn't understand that at all. Then, I was only 15 years old, and I just didn't understand, but that was a discerning that that spirit in that man was not of God, and I wanted nothing to do with it, and I told you last week how you know, in the newspaper, it came out that next day, he murdered his wife, his three children, the two neighbor children, and then committed suicide himself. So he, he was not moving by the spirit of God. He was moving by a spirit from the evil one. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to the next point, all right? It's the supernatural power to discern the realm of spirits and their activities and to identify the spirit, all right? God can use different ways. He can use visions, he can use dreams, he can use the five spiritual senses. You see something, you hear something, you smell something, all right? And so I'm going to um, tell you this one story, all right? It's not only to discern, the power to discern the realm of spirits and their activities, but to identify the spirits, to know what kind of a spirit it is 
that's operating. So all this comes under discerning of spirits. There was a young man that uh, came to my husband and I, and um, we, he, he needed prayer. We took him into the church hall. It was empty. There was nobody else, just he and my husband and myself. And uh, as we prayed for him, we laid hands on him and prayed for him, all right? Um, he had a terrible spirit of fear. And as we prayed and rebuked that spirit of fear, I saw it come out of him. You know, it was a little man, kind of very short, little dwarf looking man. And he had these big saucer eyes, huge eyes. And, and when you saw it right away, you knew it was fear. It was fear. And, and it, it came out of him and it ran down the middle aisle and it got right to the doors to go out. And then it stopped and it turned around and then it began to stealthily creep back step by step. And, and so I pointed my finger and I yelled, no, you don't. You turn around and you get out that door. But when I said, no, you don't, I heard my husband saying the same thing. And, and I turned and looked at him. He was pointing the same thing. He was seeing exactly what I had seen. All right. We saw that little creature with big eyes get up to the door. But instead of going out, like he had been told to leave completely, he was coming, his idea was to come back and jump back into that man. And the two of us saw that at the same time. And we said, no, you don't. You turn around and you get out and you keep going. And he left and he never came back again, all right? Um, there was another time that in the church hall, we, let's see how, um, a young man, we were painting the church hall. I'll start with that. And uh, a young man came to visit and I happened to be in the church hall and the man that was painting uh, was on a ladder. He was not one of our church members. So this young man came to me and said, Sister Seward, I've come to accept the Lord. He was the brother of one of our uh, lady believers. And he said, I've been listening for a couple of weeks and I, I just want Jesus in my heart. Anyways, my time is running out. So I I'm going to cut my story uh, about how he actually did accept the Lord. It's a different story and I'll tell it on a at a different time, but right after he had accepted the Lord, all this time I'm talking to him, I never smelled anything. But the moment after we began to thank and praise God because Jesus had come into his heart, I smelt the smell of strong tobacco, like cigarette. Ooh, it just went up in my nose and it was just, ooh, you know. And I didn't ask him, do you smoke? I just put my hands on his head and I rebuked a spirit of tobacco and I commanded it to get out of him and to be gone. Well, you know, later, maybe a month later, I, I was thinking about that and I thought, I, I did that and I never even asked him if he smokes. Um, so the next time I saw him, I called him by name and I said, did you used to smoke? And he said, yes, I was a chain smoker. I said, when did you stop? And he looked at me funny and he said, sister, you prayed over me. You rebuked a spirit of tobacco and commanded it to come out of me. And I've never touched a cigarette since that day. That was a discerning. I had no way to know that he smoked. I had no way to know he had a spirit of tobacco or cigarette, that he was bound by a spirit. and But God, through the Holy Spirit, revealed it through the nose, smelling, all right? And smelling, it, it's like a discerning, all right? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you some scriptural examples of this, all right? Uh, This is Acts 13, all right? Acts 13, verse 6 to 12. Elymas the sorcerer. 
And when he had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. Now, he didn't advertise, I'm a false prophet. He just looked like a man of God. And he's with this um, deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, who was a wise man, all right, and was helping him spiritually, quote, unquote, all right. On the outside, he just looked like a man of God, all right. Um, this man of God, Sergius Paulus, wanted Paul and Saul to come and hear, he wanted to hear about the word of God, about Jesus. But verse 8, Elymas the sorcerer, for so his name is by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, that means the Spirit of God came on him anew and afresh, set his eyes on this Elymas and said in verse 10, O oh, full of all subtlety, all mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And the hand of the Lord is going to be upon you. I'm not going to read verse 11. That's a different gift, all right? But here, let me tell you, it, this had to be the discerning of spirits. You wouldn't dare to tell a person to his face, you're a child of the devil, you're this, you're that. No, 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 no. I tell you, he could have been boxed. He could have been, you know, uh, arrested for doing that. He could have, yeah, uh, terrible. No, this was, a, a, the Spirit of the Lord came on Paul. And actually in verse 11, he said, you're going to be blind. Just the way that God had made him blind, and it came to pass. And the end result was the deputy saw what was done, believed, and was astonished, all right, uh, I want to do one more here because I don't want it all to be discerning of bad things because the discerning of spirits can be the good as well as the bad, all right? Uh, in Acts 14, 8 to 10, the lame man at Lystra who was impotent, a cripple from his mother's womb, all right, had never walked. Verse 9 says, the same heard Paul speak. And Paul, steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. See, the Holy Spirit in Paul realized that man had the faith to be healed. And so he said, stand upright. And he leaped up and he began to walk. So that is the deserting of spirits. There are other methods. I don't have time to go into that. I'm going to uh, go right to my conclusion right now because I've already gone 43 minutes and we're going to pray a prayer. Now, if you don't know Jesus, open your heart today and receive him into your heart and be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to lead those who are born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, now I realize why you have given me your Holy Spirit. You desire to use me as your vessel, as your instrument or weapon. You desire to flow through me to touch the lives of others, to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus, to bring healing into their lives, to fill them with your Holy Spirit. Oh, I yield myself to you right now body, soul, and spirit. Create within me a thirsting for you. Open my spiritual eyes and ears to hear your voice and sense your leading. Please let your spirit come upon me anew and afresh. I want to be a flowing river of your life to meet the needs of others and glorify your name. I thank you, Lord, that you have heard my prayer, and I cry out to you, let your revelation gifts begin to operate in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, each and every one, right now, I just feel led for you to bow your heads one more time. I I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation. 
If you don't know Jesus, accept him today. He loved you enough to die for you. He wants to come into you. He wants to live in and through you. He wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit and cause you to become a marvelous instrument of the power of God. Everybody that doesn't know Jesus, bow your head. Oh God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. He became a curse for me. He took my curse upon himself. And now, Lord, I ask you to wash away my sin with the precious blood of Jesus. Cleanse me. Cleanse me by your, your Holy Spirit using the blood of Jesus. Wash away all my sin. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I turn away from all other gods, all other religions, all other ways of thinking, because Jesus, you and you alone are the truth. You said you're the way, the truth and the life. And as I receive you now, I know my sins are washed away. I know my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I know I'm a child of the living God, and I ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon me and fill me to the overflowing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.